one of the use cases where all of this came into production was the Tirino Terrestrial Environmental Observatory, where um, I will give you a brief introduction what it was about. Um, it had obviously to do with environmental monitoring. It's an infrastructure initiative by the Helmholtz Association in Germany to provide environmental monitoring infrastructure for the scientific community. So it's an infrastructure in place that people can then group projects around to use that infrastructure. Construction started in 2008 and operations planned to run for 25 years. It's subdivided into four regional observatories and um, I was involved with the Tirino Northeast partial or sub observatory with which has eight study sites, uh, 32 platforms and until earlier this year, 35 million data in entries from various sensors and more platforms being added. And the other three regional observatories are of similar scale. The idea behind this is that with climate change, there will be some areas in Germany that will be more affected than others and affected in different ways. These areas of vulnerability had been identified and the regional observatories cover these areas. So they're located in the Alps and pre-Alps, in the Western mountains, um, looking at uh, river catchment, then in the central mountains and lowland, and then in the northeastern lowlands. Then the idea here is to look at the interactions and feedback between different uh, compartments and our ecosystem, the atmosphere, the terrestrial biosphere, and the terrestrial hydrosphere and pedosphere, so the water and soils, but also looking at different scales at uh, in basically cubic centimeter scale all the way up to whole river catchments and to, to bridge the gaps between these, these different scales. In the northeast, this is fairly spacious, spread out over the north, northeastern lowlands, which is an interesting area from an um, ecosystem development perspective because it used to be heavily farmed in the Middle Ages, where you can see the, this cross-section of a soil horizon in the lower right-hand corner where there's a medieval soil covered by windblown material from later times or younger times, because actually since the Middle Ages, the area has been decreasingly depopulated and very quickly depopulated in the past 20 years. So that's very interesting to see how things changed from intensive agricultural uh, use to almost natural park, uh, national park-like um, situations today. Particular um, trade of the Northeast Observatory is the use of geo-archives. This means looking at lakes and at trees as long-term archives in the past to then look at processes that happened decades or even centuries ago. So this means there's a lot of data coming together in from four different observatories that, that is collected into a common catalog. And the, but the data are held in the four local systems. So the catalog then has to paint, point back to the local databases. And the uh, central portal should also help not only to discover data, but also to aid visualization and, and access and allow you to download data. In the case of the Northeast Observatory, this is the more detailed um, system architecture. And it, the type is a bit too small to read on the screen, but basically it has two parallel branches. It has the branch on the left-hand side, which is file-based to keep a record of, the, of science. And it has a branch on the right-hand side to, for the services. The data come in at the top from, from the sensors in the field uh, by FTP, basically, over mobile phone networks and uh, collected on an FTP server. And when the data import tools recognize that something new has arrived, 
they start a workflow to import data. To start with the left-hand side, the data are imported into the data infrastructure, data storage infrastructure, which could also incorporate external data sets. And this data storage infrastructure has a metadata editor front end. Metadata are mostly added as part of the import process because at the time when they arrive, we know what they are. So they can automatically be annotated, but sometimes the metadata might need some editing. So that is that is what can be done at that stage. And then the all the different metadata records are harvested, transmitted over the OAI PMH protocol, Open Archives Initiative protocol for metadata harvesting into the geo network portal software. But in the case of this system, Geo Network serves only one purpose to do the translation from OER PMH to CSW, the catalog web service, so that the catalog entries can then be served to other metadata portals based on OGC standards like the Central Torino portal or the German Federal Data Infrastructure or any other metadata portals. On the right hand side is the services, and there's some other processes going on that's for instance looking at format transformations transforming things from the original formats they were delivered in to things that can be used in the services also some initial quality checks that then trigger email alerts to the scientists responsible for certain time series that they should have a look that maybe the sender is broken or something else went wrong. And that is then used as a stage to feed data into a Postgres database. The uh, data model that we used here was the Quasi data model. That's the US hydrological data model. We use that because Tirino is very much hydrology and Quasi is a very active um, community working with those uh, data and has developed a lot of tools and, and quasi standards to, to um, deal with these kind of data. But one of the requirements in setting up the system was that we had to provide a sensor observation service to serve data and, make, and allow users to query the data sets. So we use the 52 degrees north SOS data server. Um, which has a different data model than the Quasi data model. And to get from Quasi to S52 North, we created views for the, the views onto the Quasi model to um, be conformable with the 52 degrees North data model. And that is the sense observation service then, that then serves the Tirreno data portal or other OGC clients. Um, a screenshot looks like this. You can search things in the geographical context and then look at the time series, download them, filter them, whatever. This gives a good first overview, but um, this is certainly only the starting point to then uh, hook up your OGC compliant client and uh, start working with the data. Where do I think is this all heading? Data-driven research is certainly one of the buzzwords around and it is now hitting the geological sciences with some delay because in the geological sciences getting a hands on data is quite difficult and one of the things going on from DOI is I think will be identified for software with it's starting already Cyro is already um, assigning DOIs to software and this is something that I think is very necessary because similar to data and specimens, also software should be identifiable in this persistent way that would create the now missing link between papers and data because then we could understand how the data were processed and interpreted. It would also make software recognizable as a scientific achievement, which is a gap at the moment. That's something that's not always recognized that uh, creating software is a contribution to science and it would make science more transparent and reproducible. 
So assigning UI to software is a good start, but might not be enough. We would also have to think about other questions. Again, the questions of identity, versioning, or location repository to, um, to identify what we are referring to when we say we have an identifier for software. Then sensor networks are becoming more important in the geological sciences than they had been a few years ago. And these sensors can be manifold. They can be drilling rigs, they can be satellites, they can be measurements in the field, they can be drones, or they can be instruments in the lab. And at the moment, these uh, different subsystems are not well integrated, and um, the ability of creating metadata as the data are being created, that, that ability is not um, used to its full potential. Then, with more sensors around, we also have more data. So we have to find ways of working with very large data sets that are too large to be inspected in detail or even to be loaded into the desk properties. A lot of data sets you can easily download from the web are already too big to be handled in your standard desktop software. And sometimes the question could be with time series, how do you inspect three years of meteorological radar for anomalies? You cannot sit down and watch three years of rain radar. And also the process of data mining today is mainly numerical and text data, but maybe we want to work more with images and then quite different other materials, not only numbers and characters. So um, with these challenges, this also means that processing will have to move from the desktop to the cloud for large data sets. I'm, I've, you know this, but uh, <laughs> I think this is something that still needs some, some research on how we make this operational. And then there's linked data, which has been around as a buzzword for some time. And Tim Berners-Lee formulated these four principles of how he thinks linked data should work, that you use universal resource identifiers to denote things. Um, you use HTTP URIs, so these things can be referred to and looked up, or as he called it, dereferenced by people and by machines. And then um, you provide useful information about things um, using standards like uh, RDF, resource description framework, or Sparkle. It's a query language. And then you include these links and other related things when you publish data on the web. So this is basically what I showed in this earlier illustration with starting to look for papers and then going on to find data and other publications, etc. The question is, how do DOIs fit into this picture of what the linked data community calls cool URIs? DOIs being uh, resolvable through HTTP services have a resemblance to that and could be used in, in the same way. But I think we still need to do some thinking about how to bring these two worlds together. So in, in summary, persistent identifiers now allow us to publish, cite, and identify data, specimens, and software. And as we see from the numbers, data publication is now becoming more common. The principles of data identification can also be used with other materials and with software, and we encountered the same problems. But certainly the future publication, I think, will consist of elements linked by identifiers, and the paper will only be the interpretation, but it will also provide access to the data, to the materials that were used, and to the software and workflows. When more and more of the repositories are now offering uh, application programming interfaces based on linked data principles. Not all of them yet do, but I think that's the way they have to go because that will make them more useful. And it also fits with this idea of pushing processing into the cloud rather than downloading and processing on your desktop PC. And there's also future data publication, whatever publication that might mean, will cater for both people as consumers of that publication, as well as user agents, machines making use of these publications. 